What's up, guys? We are here for the first episode of the Trails of Steel History Podcast. I'm Zeph, and with me is my good friend, Jack. We always talk about history. We're always getting into uh, different historical events and historic people throughout all of history, and there's a lot of things to talk about, man. I'm very excited to have him on, and we're going to be doing this every single week, and I'm looking to, looking to get it up on Monday or Tuesday every single week around the same time and and if there's some historical figures you guys want us to cover in the comments we'll take those in consideration as well this is going to be divided between youtube and patreon we're going to go extra maybe half hour to an hour on patreon talking about a lot of different stuff continue the topic and really get into it it's going to be five dollars a month every single week we're going to get another episode on the patreon so it's we'll double the content and potentially even more as well so if you guys want to support the channel, support the content, there's a lot more we get into on the Patreon that maybe is not going to be as uh, friendly on YouTube, you know what I'm saying? So I'm very excited about it, and let's get right into it. So arguably Rome's greatest, most feared, and respected enemy in their entire history, the man born from Carthage, Hannibal Barca himself, one of the most renowned military tacticians in all of history, gave Rome's greatest defeat. This man crossed the Alps with elephants and tens of thousands of men, which is usually debated on how many men he actually crossed. I see 90,000, 80,000, 40,000, 50,000. It's a lot of men, though, to cross the Alps to get into northern Italy. The guy rode elephants from Africa into northern Italy, which is absolutely insane. He hid his soldiers on flat plains. How he did that still boggles my mind, but Jack here is going to really uh, explain as to how he did that. And many more genius tactics he pulled off through these battles, fighting in Italy for 15 years, enemy territory for 15 years, winning battle after battle after battle, but ultimately lost the war. And faced a rival of his, someone who studied him, Scipio Africanus, who is known as one of the greatest strategists in Roman history. There's a reason why Hannibal Barca is renowned throughout military tacticians around the world. Many people throughout history have studied him. Even his own enemy, the Romans, respected his intellect, respected his military prowess, and eventually did take him down. He took the, uh, the military of Carthage at 25 years old. Yep. Right? Now, I don't know exactly his motivation. His motivation started when he was a kid. His father had made him swore upon a dead animal when he was nine years old to forever be an enemy of Rome. And since that day, he held it all the way till his death. So it was like a, like a deep dedication to just all go very, after Rome because of the first Punic Wars? Yes. In the first Punic War, his father was the most famous general. Mm -hmm. And since then, his yeah. father had trained him on the battlefield. So Hannibal was a very battle-hardened person since he was a kid, basically. He pretty much grew up to he, go through war with Rome. He grew up on the battlefield, yeah. Okay. And from there, I mean, he went all the way to Rome, right, through northern Italy. But the way he got there in the first place. So we got to talk about the Alps. Oh, yep, yep. This is crazy. Yeah, so his, his journey starts obviously from Carthage, and then yeah. he sweeps over through what's modern-day Morocco. Mm -hmm. Then he sweeps into Spain. Now, if you think about this whole journey now, think about it, you're the Romans. Yeah. And you're thinking to yourself, okay, if, this, if, if these guys are going to attack us, they're going to attack us on the water because it's the closest way. Of course. You're not, you're not imagining this guy's going to sweep all around North Africa, sweep into Spain, sweep through southern France. Then go, it, at, at, initially, you're thinking that's crazy. Nobody, yeah. There's no way nobody would do that. Even his own men question uh, the path to get to northern Italy is this whole direction like a long journey through the north. I mean, but then again with the sea, the Mediterranean Sea, because the first Punic Wars, was, a lot of it was over the Mediterranean Sea, right? Yeah, yep. Who, and, who controls power in the Mediterranean? Correct. Yes, and Rome won mm -hmm. at the end, and they took over the Mediterranean Sea, right? Yep, the power was split 50-50 at that point, and the, Carthage lost a lot of its old powers. Corsica, Sardinia, Sicily, they lost a lot of those old territories. Yes, and the path through the Mediterranean Sea, a lot of people said like Hannibal couldn't go that direction so he had to find another path like mm -hmm. a detour yeah and he chooses to go through the alps right where his own men even said this is impossible and then the famous saying of hannibal was i'll either find a way or i'll make a way to Correct. do this yep. so what they say we'll say fifty thousand men because the numbers are all over the place with mm -hmm. that um you know this is ancient history so the numbers are always going to be somewhat skewed and he goes through the alps we'll say with fifty thousand men 40 50 000, and then they say 40 war elephants. Yep, that's correct. He yep. brought elephants from northern Africa into northern Italy through the Alps, which is unheard of. Mm -hmm. And he, well, he survived. Not all of his men survived, obviously. Yeah, so a lot, it worked a lot for died, him. yeah. He did make a way to get there, mm -hmm. but not for everybody. Right. Now, there's a lot of things as to, uh, there's a lot of historians that say 
maybe it wasn't just the hearth, uh, harsh conditions that killed all those men. It was like half of his troops died on the way there, they say. Right? It was like 15, 20,000? Yeah, between 15 and 20,000. Yeah. 15 to 20,000 men on the way through the Alps were gone by the time he landed in northern Italy. There may have been some skirmishes with some of the tribes up there before he got there, but the harsh conditions obviously had to have been a major component in this. And like you were mentioning, uh, we were talking about it the other day, when they were walking through the Alps, imagine yourself as one of the soldiers following Hannibal. You have to follow this guy. You're trusting him that all you guys are going to get there. Who knows what happens? Where you step with all this snow all over the place, with elephants walking, like easily you could tip over, easily people can fall off, easily with cliffs all over the place. Like if an elephant stepped the wrong way and they tumbled over. And the interesting thing about that is the, the Romans picked up word, they picked up intel uh, that he was coming through that, through Spain and through France once he reached the, the Pyrenees Mountains, which is between Spain and France. And they said, wow, he, he's really doing it. So he came through there and then he had to, I remember, you're going, he's going through foreign territory. Now we know through history, it's very hard to trust Celtic tribes. They're, they're very warlike people at that time. So it was very difficult to trust them. So Hannibal's on guard the whole way as he's going. So as he crosses through the Alps, you got to remember one thing. These are absolutely horrible conditions to cross through. Snow, ice. Pe- it was the autumn season. Yeah. Okay. But as he gets in there, he now, not only is he worried about the temperature now, there's Gallic tribes that live inside the Alps. So what Hannibal does, this is smart right here. Hannibal always sends out scout- scouting parties ahead of him to make sure the coast is clear. And what he does now, he's, he, at one point during his crossing, he realizes he's going through a low, through a low pass. Mm-hmm. So he, basically, he's got high cliffs to both sides. This is perfect for oh, perfect ambush. Perfect for ambush, yeah, yeah. Perfect for ambush. So what he does is he places his heavy infantry in the back. This is smart because now, usually this is where you're going to get attacked in a spot like this. So what happens is, as he's crossing through this area, all of a sudden, Celtic tribes start throwing boulders and logs and arrows and slings and all kinds of different projectiles coming down, just as he predicted. Celtic army, a Gallic unit comes from behind to attack him. He's ready for it, though. The heavy infantry are ready. They beat off the Gallic tribe, tri- tribesmen in the back. Yeah. And then they fight their way through the trap in the front, and they eventually get out. All this happened throughout the Alps, right? Mm-hmm. He's fighting other people. He's trying to fight the harsh conditions. And by the way, he was there for, what, 15, 16 days through the Alps? Yep, yep. It seems like impossible. Now, the fact that he couldn't bring siege weapons could have led to a failure later on. This is what a lot of like a lot of research shows. Right, right. Um when he finally had Roman sites. The reason no, there could be many reasons, right? They're still kind of debated on. But a big reason a lot of people seem to think that he couldn't take or sack Rome was because he didn't have the siege weapons because he went through the Alps in the first place. But he did have the engineers, right? Yes, he did have siege engineers from Carthage. Okay. And and the thing about this, uh, the crossing of the Alps is what also made that extremely scary is mm-hmm. anybody who's a skier or a snowboarder knows what that is, what a void is, yeah. a void in the snow. So when you cross the snow, it looks like flat ground. It looks like, you know, it's just another pile of snow, you step on it, whatever. A lot of men fell down these voids. They would step on it, the snow would collapse, and a guy, would, uh, a whole unit of men would just, you know, fall 100 feet to their death, and possibly even elephants too would fall right on top of them. You know, war machines would trample them, and it was just... Just awful. Absolutely awful. And he finally got through. He finally landed in Italy, northern Italy. It says like 20,000 men, right? Around there. And after harsh conditions through the Alps, he goes and starts fighting with the Roman forces. And it's quite incredible, like the resilience of like not only him, but his troops to go through all of this and then start winning the actual war itself under such a disadvantage. And now they're in enemy territory. They fight through Italy for like, what, 15 years? Mm Mm-hmm in enemy territory for 15 years after crossing the Alps, and he's winning battle after battle. Now, what was the battle right after he landed in uh, northern Italy? After he successfully crosses the Alps, he comes across, because in in that northern region of Italy, it's a bunch of Celtic tribes. He comes across the Torini tribe. Now, the Torini tribe, now remember now, he's got to spread word that he's the real deal. Mm -hmm. So what he does is he attacks the major town of the Torini. What happens is he kills every person, every human being in there, men, women, children, all is dead. Now, obviously, when a commander or a general in any period of history, modern or ancient, does this, this is to send a word out. This, this is, this is, this it's is, an example. It's a fear monger yeah. tactic. So, and this is, and Hannibal is really, really good at this. It's ruthless, by the way. Oh, like, absolutely That, that is evil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely ruthless. Yeah. And once he did that, the other Celts were like, oh, this guy means business. Mm-hmm. The Romans, uh, Publius, Scipio, not mm. Scipio Africanus, but his father yeah, okay. gets word of this and they send him to go fight against Hannibal. Mm. So then Hannibal and him meet at the Tequinus River. 
The Tequinas River is a really important battle because at the Tequinas River, what happens is, is it's, it's a cavalry battle for the most part. Now, what happens is what normal times, what was normal at that time, they would, it, most battles started with skirmishes. Yeah. So, or slight skirmishes to break up ranks. So what, now the Romans had a, a unit called the Velitus. These guys were javelin throwers. They would throw javelins, break up ranks, infantry would sweep in. Yeah. Why, so why would they call them that? The Velitus? Yeah. It's just a Latin name for them. Oh, okay. What happens is after that is the Velitus are getting put into position right before the battle starts. Hannibal's men are, are creeping up towards the battlefield. Now here's what now here's the one thing the Romans didn't expect. Hannibal literally ordered a full blitz of his army. This is not this is not conventional for the time. Orders a full blitz, and then the Velitus don't even have us did not throw a single javelin. Not a single javelin was thrown. They instantly withdrew because they said we don't have enough time. So the ca- Roman cavalry sweeped in. Carthaginian cavalry attack each other. Now it's very fierce fighting. From here on out, the Numidian cavalry. The Numidian cavalry is the best cavalry at that time in the world. It is the best cavalry. So what happens is these cavalry men, Numidian cavalry, sweep around the Roman flanks, smash, completely smash, and Publius Scipio, Scipio Africanus' father, yeah. he gets knocked off his horse and injured in battle. Now there's two stories to this. Okay. One story is a slave saves him. This is not a popular one. And then the more popular version of the story is his son saves him. Africanus, yeah. yeah. We'll get to him after, yeah. Now remember, this Roman army is completely annihilated. 2,000 men are killed. They withdraw. And then Hannibal now furthers his, his attention further south. Here's the thing about, you know, if uh, a slave saved him, right? That would be, uh, back in those days, it would be like very dishonorable. It would be humiliating. Humiliating yeah. that a slave saved one of the generals at the time. They would lose face, yeah. Yeah. And also, it, it not only dishonors like the general itself, but also the troops around. Like, why couldn't they do it? Why, why, why would you leave this to a slave in order to do this? And it's much more heroic, right, for the son, Africanus, who later becomes like one of the most renowned strategists and generals of the, the Roman time. Of course, it would sound a lot better if he did it. I don't know which one's true. Mm-hmm. Which one do you think? Me personally, I think, the, I personally believe the slave did it just because if you say Scipio Africanus did it, it yeah. sounds great. It makes a great story. It's glorifying his son, building up the story to Africanus. Yeah. I think personally the slave did it yeah. because it sounds more real. Yeah, and this is a, a, this is a common thing throughout history where oh, yeah, yeah. You, to glorify a certain figure in history you know just like to up the morale as well you know if if people don't hear word of it like let's say you're the first word they hear like uh, whatever roman troops on another part of the known world right they don't know who saved uh scipio right Mm -hmm. it's much better to hear for them to hear that african as his son saved him right Mm -hmm. you know build morale as well throughout the the military so like from there where does hannibal go now from 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 the tequinas river now he has to head further south so what he does is now the next battle after Tachinus is the Trebia River. So but before the Trebia River, Rome announces two new consuls. These are basically generals, yeah. Flaminius and Geminus. So now Hannibal has another tough crossing to do. This is very difficult now. This Now he f- has to cross through the Apennine Mountains. This is, this is further south of what the Alps that he crossed. Yeah. So now what happens is now Geminus is guarding the eastern side of the Apennine, Flaminius the western side. Now Hannibal's stuck in a situation, okay, where do I go from here? If I go west, they know I'm coming. If I go east, they know I'm coming. I can't attack Geminus because Fulminius is going to swing around and back him up. So I got to I have to go undercover somehow. He crosses through the Apennine Mountains through the, you know, cover of nights yeah. and everything. And now here's the here's the very tough part now. He crosses into this area which is uh the Arno the Arno swamp. Now this area is a swamp. You everybody knows you don't if you're a military commander, you never go through marshy swamp areas because it's full of infection, full of bugs, diseases. This is where people get this is where people die at in large numbers. And this is actually where Hannibal lost his uh one of his eyesight. He went blind in one eye forever for the rest of his life. He caught an infection. They say a bug stung him in the eye. And the council that was on the western side of the Apennine Mountain, because that's where the Arno swamp was. They didn't expect him to come through there because they said it's foolish to cross through there. It's full of infection, disease. He's not. His men aren't going to make it. Well, Hannibal, one of the greatest risk takers in history. Yeah, he did it. So, <laughs> risk taker is like an understatement. Oh, big time! And then the Battle of Trebia. Okay, so and that's one of the major ones. This is a huge battle right here. Yeah, yeah, battle yeah. of Trebia is huge. So now at the Battle of Trebia, now it's fought, it's it's in December now. Mm-hmm. It's very very cold outside, freezing temperatures again. This is this is very interesting now because now you see the administrative side to Hannibal now. Mm-hmm. The Romans are getting ready in their camp. Hannibal's getting ready in his camp. 2,000 Celtic soldiers in the Roman camp defect in the middle of the night. They kill a bunch of Roman soldiers in their sleep. Hannibal gets word of this. 
But remember, it's only 2,000, and I only say 2,000, and I'm going to explain why I say only 2,000. Hannibal now mm-hmm. uses propaganda as a tactic mm. to use against the Celtic neighboring tribes, okay. the ones that are around that, that region, to get them to convert to his side and say, hey, join my team. All he, he lies, of course. There's lies behind us. He says, all of your people are betraying you and joining my side. Look, they've even betrayed the Romans. They've even killed them in their sleep. Join my side. So... As most people think, propaganda is used in ancient times, not just in modern times. Yeah. For example, World War One, World War Two, even more modern. Right? Yeah, this is like 200 or some BC. Yeah. We're talking 2,200 years ago. Yeah. Propaganda is no new method. It's been used forever. And it's successful. Okay. Hannibal's successful in his propaganda war. He's The Celts join him. So what happens is the Romans are in their camp. Hannibal sends his Numidian cavalry to attack the Roman camp. Now the Romans, they have, they're asleep. They don't have a clue what's going on. They're asleep. People screaming, arrows, all kinds of projectiles are being rained upon mm. in their camp. Yeah, they're just resting in freezing cold temperatures. You just see arrows, javelins, all kinds of different projectiles just being rained upon you. And you have to, you're not even armed. You're not even ready. You got to grab all you your You got to jump and get ready to go right there. Horrible conditions to wake yeah. up to. Horrible. And not only that, that has an effect on a soldier psychologically too. Now these soldiers are going to expect, okay, we can't even camp. Even in the winter where people are probably going to be less likely to fight or willing to fight. But they're gonna. But someone like Hannibal's gonna use it to his advantage, right? And that's what the Roman councilman told the men to charge, charge the Numidian cavalry. Hannibal purposely tells his men retreat. Mm-hmm. Now they retreat across the Trebia River. Now these guys already woke up in the worst way possible. Now they have to cross ice cold water. This is terrible. Now this is this is even more. This is just even a harder blow to the psyche of a soldier. So now he crosses the Treb. The Romans cross the Trebia River to go chase the, Car- the Numidian cavalry. Now the battle starts here. The Roman infantry is bigger than that of the Carthaginian infantry, but Hannibal outnumbers their cavalry. So the cavalry clashes. Romans are actually winning the infantry fight. They're actually winning. That. Really? Yeah, they're winning the infantry fight. But ha- of course, Hannibal's cavalry, that's where his strength is. So he beats the Romans, Roman cavalry off. But what one thing the Romans didn't realize was... The night before, Hannibal hid 2,000 elite soldiers on a riverbed behind the battlefield where they were fighting. So the Romans have no idea. There's 2,000 guys in waiting for ambush. Yeah. So the Romans are, you know, they're beating back the Carthaginian infantry. 2,000, those 2,000 soldiers spring into action. The cavalry and Hannibal's ambush troops sweep in from the back, completely annihilate Roman army. 40,000 Romans came to battle that day. 30,000 died. And this is like a common theme with Hannibal where he's always flanking, hiding his troops somewhere. He's always using the propaganda. This is not the first time he used propaganda and got the Celtics to defect and stuff like that. He's done oh, it many times. Oh, yes. He's done that throughout. He's used propaganda throughout the war, yes. Not just not just in this instance. It's a reason why everybody regards him as one of the greatest tacticians because I, there's no bounds for the guy, right? Oh, yeah. Hannibal is just, he to him, It's he can do anything. He can go anywhere, fight any army, and he'll win. Yeah, and this is a, a famous saying with, um, was it after the Battle of Kanai? Right? Where they said, like, he knows how to gain victory. He just doesn't know how to use his victories. Correct. Right? Yeah. he's and, and, and I have a saying of my own. I say he's a tactical genius, but a strategic failure. So he's very, very good at winning battles. Mm-hmm. But when it comes to delivering the knockout punch, he just doesn't do it. Yeah. I mean, he, he was winning battle after battle. Fear throughout all of the Romans. They have to respect him as well. Obviously, they're not just going to run away. They have to face him eventually because he's, he's in their country. The whole time. Where do they go from there? The next battle is Battle of Lake Trasimene. So now as he's heading towards Trasimene, because he wants to get closer to Rome. Now this is further south. He wants to get close to Rome, but there's a Roman army coming after him. Now he's now, now he's at Lake Trasimene. Yeah. At Lake Trasimene, there's a type of terrain called a defile. A defile is when you're between a lake or a gorge and mountains or hills. Lake Trasimene and a bunch of mountains to his other side. So now he's got a problem now. By this time, Hannibal's got around... 40 to 50,000 guys. He knows the Romans are coming fast behind him. He sees, he sees the terrain. He sees he can use it as an ambush. Hannibal has a famous quote, have the land fight for you, which is true. So what he does now is he says, okay, perfect. I'm going to use this mountain right here to hide my men. And this is now what you're seeing here now is you're seeing a Sun Tzu tactic being used here. This is, this is beautiful right here. So what he does is he sends men further ahead of the lake he's, where they set up campfires and they just set up their whole camp basically. So just a small band of men. So now the other problem he has is how do I get tens of thousands of soldiers up this mountain without leaving any any foot tracks behind? Because they'll see that. Yeah. So what he does is in the, in the cover of night, he sweeps around the mountain that's next to the lake. They go behind and up the mountain that way. So now when the Romans finally cross to this area, they see a small band of men that yeah. were ca- setting campfires and everything. They see them and they're like, 
I got him. Yeah. I've got Hannibal. He doesn't even know I'm here. But this is the thing, though. Hannibal's much closer than they think. This is the Sun Tzu tactic where he says, make them believe you're close when you're far, and then make them believe you're far when you're close. So what happens is the Romans are marching. They're like, okay, we're going to get them. I see their campfires. He's further down that way. We got him. It's in the morning now. Heavy fog and heavy mist is covering the whole area. The yeah. Romans can't see. Hannibal on top of this mountain with his men, he can see everything because he's above the, the fog and the mist. Yeah. The war horn sound, Hannibal's men come raining down the mountain by Trezimir. So he's also got a battlefield or ground advantage, right? Oh, sure. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. He's, okay. He has, oh, but yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's on the, he's on the mountain. So okay. he's, the Romans are essentially fighting an uphill battle. Yeah. When they attack the Romans, the Romans don't even have their weapons out. They're not even ready. Hannibal smashes into the Romans. So many Romans are killed. As a matter of fact, though, a whole entire Roman army was killed in three hours. In three hours, a whole entire Roman army was completely annihilated. How, how much would you say was there? 15,000 Romans died. 15,000 Romans. In that's, I mean, that's just, that's record breaking. You're talking, and he just, this is, you're, this again shows the brilliance of Hannibal. He knows how to control men. He's very disciplined and he understands how to make the terrain fight for him. Yeah. Extremely deceiving too. Very deceiving, yeah. So even in hard, so there seems to be a common thing with like him even able to fight under the harsh conditions. This guy comes from Africa, by the way, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Where the the climate's probably not as yeah, it's warmer. It's much warmer, right? But even when going into Italy, where it's winter, it's snowing, it's cold, he's able to adjust quickly and adapt to the environment and use it even against his enemy. Now, at, when he fought at Trasimene, it was warmer weather at that time. Yeah, yeah. So it was, I believe it was in spring when okay. he fought at Trasimene. I believe it was in spring, if I'm not wrong. And and what's it's interesting is you see, again you see that at the Battle of Lake Trasimene, you see uh -huh. the Sun Tzu tactic: make the enemy believe you're close when you're far, make them believe you're far when you're close. Yep. So it's and he plays that he out. Plays perfect. decoys. He has baits out there, mm -hmm. you know, with the, the camp. They see the they see the campfires yeah. and they're like, okay, we got him. The Romans think they got him because they see they see a campfire from far. And Hannibal's right up the hill. They don't even see him, and then he just smashes right into them. 15,000 soldiers. Now, by this time, Hannibal had been into, into the Italian peninsula for seven months. And in seven months, 50,000 Romans have been killed mm -hmm. in battle. That's 10 legions. That's absolutely insane. Well, this is in northern Italy? This is like central Italy right central here. Central Italy? Okay. So now from here, now this is where, now this is the big mystery right here now. Okay. Yeah. Where do we go from here? Now it's, so Hannibal's less than 10 days march away from Rome. Biggest, one of the biggest mysteries in history is why does he not attack Rome? He just he just devastated an entire Roman army that tries to meet. So what happens is Rome's open. And the problem with this now, here's the thing. Roman armies are spread thin now. You have Roman armies in Sicily, Corsica, Sardinia. And the Roman ships are mostly focused on Sicily because the Carthaginians had sent ships to go fight against them, but the Carthaginians ultimately failed. Yeah. Why Hannibal didn't attack Rome, it's not entirely sure. Rome, at that time, its population was roughly around half a million, between 450,000 to 500,000 people. So why he didn't attack Rome, it's not clear, but the path was definitely open for him. And it's not really the, the, the siege part of it. Be because he did have the siege engineers with him, yeah. It's not manpower. He had 50,000 guys with him, so he definitely had sufficient amount of men to do it. And he could have cut off Roman ma major Roman supplies. So why, again, it's one of those mysteries. We don't know why he didn't do it. Yeah, I was like, I see a lot of like historians debate on this. Like, why did he not attack Rome? Because it was right there for him. The siege weapon is the big thing I always see people bring up. Right. Because he, uh, it, it's logical. He couldn't bring them there. But he does have the engineers to create new. He has all that. Now, it could be, did he get exhausted? See, th that's the thing. I think he was afraid that Rome would have called all its armies back, which, they de which I believe they definitely would have. If they would have called all their armies back and he would have had to face multiple armies all at once. Mm -hmm. But he would have been able to pick, I believe he would have been able to pick them apart one by one instead of having to face all that, that brunt attack all at once. Yeah. And even if so, even if they would have called all their armies back, that would have opened up Corsica. Sorry. Sardinia, Spain, yeah. That would have opened up Sicily. Yeah. The Carthaginians could have could have focused their attacks in other areas. And the Romans, because remember, the, the Romans had taken the northern part of Iberia and that was, that was a big loss for the Carthaginians. Yeah. Carthaginians could have got that back. So uh, from there he heads south, right? He heads south. Yep, correct. Right. They said like he was trying to um, he was trying to resupply some of his uh, troops in the south, which is what goes down to your thing where you said he was a great tactician, but not necessarily a war strategist. It's much more than just winning battles. It's much more than just gaining advantages. Yeah. So basically, what it comes down to is that when you're in war, in any kind of war, whether it be military or political, there's tactics and then there's strategy. Yeah. Strategy is the goal. What is the intention? Tactics. 
how you, your methods on how you're going to achieve your goal. Hannibal got the two mixed up. He believed that his tactics were going to win him the war when in, in reality, there you need to deliver the final knockout punch. If you don't, you're not going to win. So the Battle of Kanai happens in two, two, like 216 right? Right. BC, 216 BC. And is that where Africanus started taking uh, action after? Africanus took, uh, yeah, after the Battle of Kanai. Yes, after the Battle of Kanai. So Scipio Africanus. So this is that son that apparently saved his father way before. Mm -hmm. He studied Hannibal. During this time, he's a, he's a young, he's, he's young. So he's, he's in his teens. Yeah. And as Hannibal's rampaging through Italy. Yeah. What happens is, is he's getting this opportunity to study the way Hannibal fights, yeah. the way his, his tactics, his all these things, he's, how he organizes his men, how he attacks, where he wants to fight, how he wants to fight, and he's getting all of this down. Yes, and he becomes, I, I guess you can say in a way, like the rival of Hannibal uh, later on where he faces him. He gets his opportunity to study Hannibal. Rome at this point is like fearing this man, but Scipio Africanus is, is using it in a different way. He's... Learning his tac uh, tactics. At a certain point, he learns, like, what is Hannibal fear? Like, what is Hannibal missing out here? What does he not want Rome to do or Ro the Roman army to do? Scipio yeah. Africanus is the, he's basically the underdog on the rise. Yeah. He's, he's, he's building up. He's yeah. a teen when he, when he fights against Hannibal at the Battle of Tachinus with his father. He's just, he's just a teen. So, and throughout this, all this time, he's building up. But another important figure in this war is a guy named Fabius. Okay. There's something called, he was a Roman general that got, he be actually was, proclaimed by the Roman Senate to become dictator. So mm. what happened was is... So who's this guy? Fabius, he's a Roman consul. Okay. But the Roman Senate gives him the title of dictator. After the Battle of Lake Trasimene, 50,000 Romans had already been lost in seven months. That's 10 legions. That's that's enormous. Yeah. So they put Fabius in charge. Fabius, now he's there's a famous strategy called the Fabian Delay or the Fabian Strategy. And what this is is Fabius tells the Roman Senate, look, you guys are doing it wrong. You guys are trying to fight Hannibal at his game. Hannibal's in our country. He can't win as long as he's here because he has the forge for men and supplies. He can't get it from Carthage. He's in Italy. They can't, you can't just send supplies that way. He needs to forage for all his men, mm -hmm. all his supplies, all his resources, everything. He has to forage for it. Fabius says, okay, we're going to put him into deep waters. We're going to starve him out. Don't fight this guy in pitched battles. Yeah. Don't fight him Don't head fight on. him head on, no confrontation. So what happens is, is and, and Fabius is actually successful for a while at this, but the Roman Senate, though, again... Roman Senate becomes impatient. What Fabius is doing, just small skirmishes, starve Hannibal out, cut off his supplies, don't fight him head on. It's not going to work. And it works for a while for Fabius. Roman Senate says, look, we're not getting the job done. We got to get these guys replaced. But just before that happens, there's a very interesting part of the war called uh, the, the, the Battle of Augur Falernus. Now, this area in Italy is very rich in resources. So Hannibal managed to reach this area. And what Hannibal's doing to try to bait that Romans into fighting is he's burning all their crops, burning supplies. He's trying to destroy all these things. So what he's trying to do essentially is bait the Romans into a fight, the kind of fight he wants to fight. Fabius never takes the bait, never. So what happens here at Alger Falernus, Hannibal, doesn't re Hannibal realizes it late, but he realizes that he's surrounded. To the north, he's got Fabius's army. To the east... He's got Roman garrisons. To the south, Roman garrisons. And to the west, the Tyrrhenian Sea or the Mediterranean. So he's really got nowhere to go. So he says, no matter where I move, I'm going to get hit. This is smart right here. This is where Hannibal's a genius. In the middle of the night, he sends a bunch of oxen with torches attached to them on fire. They go rampaging down this area where there's a mountain. And the Romans say, there he is. Roman army gets sent. So now what happens is when the Roman army comes out of their position... They just opened up a hole now for Hannibal to go through. So they think, they see a bunch of torches being lit and they see a bunch of what looks like men on horses. When the Romans finally reach this area, they're like, just a bunch of oxen. Yeah. But Hannibal set up a trap. On the mountain next to all this happening, a bunch of Gallic soldiers come down to fight against this Roman contingent that got sent. Hannibal's moving on the other side of the mountain under the cover of night. Fabius has no idea. Fabius just sees fighting going on and he says, don't, don't engage. Don't engage. Some Roman troops are fighting against the Gallic troops. Fabius has no idea that, he's, that Hannibal's sneaking around these, sneaking right behind him. And the next morning, Fabius wakes up, Hannibal's gone. How's he gone? He was just here. Next thing you know, they find out that he went through, he completely left the, the Augur Falernus. Now they have to, now they're going to go chase him down again. And again, it shows the brilliance of Hannibal. So he, where did he go from there? From there, the, the Roman Senate, they strip Fabius of his title. Yeah. So now they're going to announce two new 
because uh, they start getting impatient with the Fabian strategy, right? Delay and you know, delay, delay. Yeah, it's too much. Like they got, they need, they need results. They the need res- yeah, the Roman Senate, they're growing impatient. They yeah. want to see Hannibal dead. Yeah. So they announced two new consuls, Paulus and Varro. Now Varro comes from humble beginnings. Varro's a guy. He, he doesn't come from a, a noble family. He doesn't come from, you know, patrician type family, anything like that. Paulus, on the other hand, Paulus was in 219 BC, he was fighting in Illyria, and that war was very different because he wasn't fighting pitched battles. He was fighting both on the sea and on land. So it was different than going up against Hannibal. Now, this battle right here, the Battle of Cannae, this is where Paulus and Varro meet up against Hannibal. This right here is, this battle right here is by far, I personally believe, the biggest defeat Rome has ever faced. That's what they say. Yeah, 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 100%. And it's it's the one by far one of the bloodiest battles in history of any of any general of any time period. But in this battle right here is pure tactical genius. Just the Roman army they bring eighty six thousand Romans, yeah. biggest army that had ever been seen up to this point. And we're talking about this is past Alexander the Great. This yep. is after all that. Yep, yep, yep. After Sun Tzu and all these greats that uh, military greats that you've seen throughout history. Yep. After Pyrrhus, after Alexander, after yep Sun Tzu, after all those guys. Yeah. So. What happens is they meet up at the Canai. The Romans want to fight on a thin, on a thin strip because they're, like I said, they're based on infantry. Mm-hmm. You're seeing another Sun Tzu tactic being played here. Know the enemy, know yourself, and you'll never lose. He knows how the Romans want to fight. He knows where they want to fight. He knows why they want to fight. Hannibal knows himself. He knows what he's capable of. He knows what he can do. So Hannibal takes, says, all right, we'll fight there. They fight on that thin strip. 70,000 infantry and then... 16,000 cavalry is what the, the Romans. Romans. Yeah. And uh, for Hannibal, how much would you say uh, on his side? It was like 45,000? Yeah. Hannibal has between 45, 50,000 troops. But most, the brunt of his force is in the cavalry, though. That's where his strength is, in his, is in his cavalry. So he was able to hide his soldiers on plain fields in front of the enemy. They did not see them. I still don't know how he did it, how he did that, because I've researched it enough and I couldn't make sense of it. So, so this is the thing about that battle. Hannibal was, this is really intelligent. Yeah. This is super intelligent. Something really remarkable that he did. He knew that the end, that the Romans wanted to fight on a thin field between the town of Cannae and the river. Yeah. So, and he knew that because the Romans like to fight with infantry. They're very heavy on infantry. Yeah. So Hannibal knew there was going to be a lot of infantry fighting. So what that does is that picks up a lot of dust. And when that picks up, he used that dust to mask his Libyan infantry that had not yet fought. So when the Romans were fighting against what they thought was the bulk of the infantry, they were pushing them back and they thought, oh, we're beating these guys. That's when Hannibal sprung the trap. When they didn't, and and literally on open field, he hid thousands of soldiers and got, got them into position. They just started slaughtering the Roman infantry. So the ones that he hid was the elite soldiers, where he left kind of like the, I don't want to say weak ones, but like... His heavy infantry. His yeah. heavy infantry in front and then came around. Was that what he did? Well, what it was, was the, the battle The battle starts like this. So yeah. he has his men shaped in a bow formation to where the belly of the bow is facing towards the enemy. And the Romans are, are in their, uni- their normal uniform. Yeah. They attack the heavy infantry of, they both clash into each other. And this is, this takes incredible, incredible discipline. Yeah. Hannibal, their men need, to, are watching their own men side by side dying. And at the same time, as they're being beat back, the Carthaginians, yeah. they're making a V shape. Yeah. So what happens is, as they're making this V shape, they're, the Romans don't even realize they're getting enveloped. They think they're winning the fight. They don't realize they're getting enveloped. They don't. Okay, yeah, they don't see the the ambush, the flank. They're getting hit, and the Romans are they're, they're getting excited. They're like, "Hey, we, we got this. Yeah. We're pushing them back." On the other side of the fight, you have the cavalry fight. Yeah, Hannibal's got the best cavalry of the day, the Numidians. These guys right here, they right when Hannibal's cavalry charged against Roman cavalry, shattered the Roman cavalry. Shattered it. Didn't even stand a chance. So now, once the V shape is almost complete, the Libyan soldiers that he was hiding in plain sight, attack, they fill up the V formation, and then, so now they're enveloped on the sides. The Carthaginian cavalry sweeps them from behind mm-hmm. and just smashes, completely smashes the Roman army. 50 to 70,000 Romans killed in six hours. Till this day, that is a record that is cannot be broken mm-hmm. because when you look at it, you're, you're talking swords, spears, shields, arrows, not missiles, bombs, and automatic weaponry. Yeah. This is insane. I mean, a lot of people like to say throughout history, it's one of the, the perfect victories throughout history, but I do have to reference about Sun Tzu, obviously. But Sun Tzu said the, the perfect victory actually is where you don't kill anybody, or mm-hmm. and nobody dies during the battle, but you use whoever's alive against the enemy. But with Hannibal, that battle tactic, the double envelope uh, envelopment tactic, 
still goes out throughout history. Like even other generals, I know Napoleon studied him a lot. Napoleon holds Hannibal to very high regard. Yep, yep. And I can understand from there, after the famous Battle of Cannae, Rome at that point had to fear this man. Right? Oh, he absolutely. Was, yeah. He was going to go right after Rome, right after. Like this is the next target in sight is Rome itself. Right? Absolutely. Yep. So, and again, you know, like we mentioned earlier, you know, the bow shape he makes. Yeah. So the belly of the bow is facing towards the Romans and then the Romans smash into the infantry, slowly making a V-shape. And the thing about this I want to mention is the discipline. Hannibal, out of all the generals, you talk about Alexander, Julius Caesar, Napoleon, you talk about Hannibal by far, in my opinion, out of all these guys had the best control when it came to men, controlling men, even in desperate situations. They don't compare to it because Hannibal could be in a horrible situation and he had complete control of his army no matter what. And they were loyal to him even in those desperate times. So what's happening is, imagine, you're fighting side by side with your with your teammates, basically, and your teammates are dropping, but you still have to keep formation. You still have to keep this V shape going. You can't break rank. And as this is happening, this takes a tremendous amount of discipline. He literally hit the Libyan infantry. In plain sight. And, okay, I also do, I also do hear that... Uh, could it be something with the sunlight too? I've seen people, like he was able to use the sunlight against them. He was able to use, as you said before, the dust and the debris and all that stuff. And it's like, I still don't understand it. Honestly, when even even though it makes, I could I don't know if it actually makes sense. I'm not going to lie. But he did it. Yeah, it's, it's what it is, is when, whenever, in when you have a large amount of infantry, especially when they're fighting, yeah. it's going to pick up a lot of dust. I mean, yeah. you're, it's going to be a lot of dust and debris and you're just it's very hard to see past i'd say maybe 20 feet 30 feet in front of you it's very hard to see especially if there's guys coming at you trying to kill you yeah they didn't even they didn't see these libyan infantry guys on the sides waiting to just they didn't see that so once the libyans got called into battle that filled in the v formation Mm -hmm. so now they're enveloped on on the sides the flanks hannibal's cavalry completely shattered the roman cavalry they never stood a chance varro ran away that council the roman general varro he ran away he, he left they just swarmed in and just completely annihilated the romans and that battle is known as the battle of annihilation because the romans didn't lose they got annihilated and it's it's very and again sun tzu said it he sun tzu theorized that the double envelopment tactic could be done but he said it's not good because whenever you put men in a desperate situation they're going to fight even harder. Now yeah, so if you circle them, that you put them in that desperate situation, and they're going to fight back. Yeah, if, if you don't give them a way out. At that point, the only way through is through you. It's through you, yeah. yeah the only yeah. way they can get out is through you. And and that's and, But Hannibal said, we're going to completely encircle them and annihilate them completely. And, and he proved it wrong. 86,000 86, men were brought to battle that day. Fifty to 70,000 died in six hours. Unbelievable. Absolutely unbelievable. That is insane. And from there, right, obviously Rome is open. Yeah. After Kanai, Rome is open. Maharbal, the famous, the famous saying, Maharbal tells him, Hannibal, you have defeated the strongest, largest Roman army. Now's the chance. Destroy Rome. Go for it. Hannibal doesn't throw the knockout punch. And he says, Hannibal knows how to gain victory, doesn't know how to use it. And it's interesting because when you study Hannibal... It, 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 Hannibal is a very interesting figure. It's, it's 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 one of those figures that again, tactical genius, strategic failure, and that's where we go to Africanus. Then this is the rise of Africanus. So now, how do you beat Hannibal? Now Hannibal just destroyed the biggest army at this point after Cannae. The Romans lost well over a hundred thousand guys during the war. When you talk about population and compare it to now, it's massive. Like, oh, you lose a hundred thousand men. That's, that's back enormous. then. Yeah, it's it's. Yeah unparalleled it's like no it's enormous yeah Yeah. if you lost and the thing about that what makes it difficult too is supplies money money is needed to 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 build this kind of army and and that takes a toll on the people that on normal civilian life that takes a toll because you take you're taking from them yeah and so it's very difficult so now the romans have to come up with a new strategy basically how do we beat hannibal so now they skip you africanus he's about 19 20 years old after the battle of Cannae. Scipio Africanus wants to fight Hannibal, actually wants to fight him. So eventually they end up sending him to to Carthage. Okay, so this is the thing. So Hannibal, they say, feared one thing, the Romans attacking Carthage itself. Yes. Because how would he get back, right, before they get there? Right. Scipio knew this, right? Yeah, yep, yep. uh, Study Hannibal, and through studying Hannibal, you can theorize that he learned what Hannibal feared throughout this whole war. Yeah, not, he understood. Yeah. He understood Hannibal very well at this point. He was—he's been studying him. He's been—I mean, he was in 
Hannibal's waging war in the Italian peninsula, and Scipio was studying all these tactics, all these different methods of how Hannibal fights and where and why he wants to fight. He was fight. in the laboratory the whole time just waiting. Yeah, he's basically it's training for him yeah. to understand his enemy better. And then once they send him to Carthage, this is the thing I do want to make clear about this part of the war. A lot of people think the war ended at the Battle of Zama. The war ended once Hannibal left Italy. The war was waged against Rome on Italian grounds. Once he left Italy... That's it. The Second Punic War is over. It was over because the goal's the goal's over. Like he, his goal was to take over Rome, to essentially, do, essentially burn down Rome. Yeah, and you're not in Italy no more. War is over. Yep. And uh, Scipio, or at least the people in charge, knew at that point you don't fight Hannibal head on anymore. No, no. And, and it's very, it's very. Scipio got gathered a lot of intel on how to fight Hannibal, and he he was very successful at it, obviously at the Battle of Zama, and it's the famous saying, you know. At the Battle of Zama, they say, Scipio asks him, who's the great, who are, who do you believe are the, is the greatest generals to have existed? He said, Hannibal says, Alexander's the first, then Pyrrhus of Epirus, the second. Yeah. And he says, who do you consider to be third? And he said, if I defeat you, I'm the greatest general of all time. Obviously, Hannibal loses that battle. He yeah, loses in the Battle of Zama. Now, exactly where was uh, the Battle of Zama? Uh, in, it was in Carthage. Okay. Yep, it was in Carthage. Okay. And then that is where most people believe, uh, most people believe the Second Punic Wars ended was the the loss of Hannibal there. But really, when the war was over was when he left Rome. And there is a lot of um, there is a lot of debate as to how Hannibal got back. Couldn't cross through the Mediterranean because the Romans would have countermeasures for that already, you know, but he could use the Greek allies that he had already to get through the, uh, through the waters. You know, the old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And Hannibal took that to his advantage. So those people on, those side of the, on that side of Europe helped him out, get the ships ready. And the thing that's interesting about the Second Punic War at this point is that Romans have a saying. It's not the first battle or the second battle, but the last battle. Hannibal won every single battle in the Second Punic War, but he lost the war. So again, tactical genius, strategic failure. Isn't that kind of crazy to think about? Yeah. You won every single battle in the war, but then you lost the war. Right, he did never delivered the knockout punch. He never gave that that one hit that was just going to finish them off. And he two twice he had that opportunity twice after Canai and after uh, Lake Trasimene. Yes, and he just did not pull the trigger. Especially after the especially after Trasimene, he was less than ten days march away. Yeah, that's not and under spring autumn spring and summer. Can, oh, it was perfect weather, perfect uh, perfect season, perfect opportunity to go and you know accomplish his final goal that he was set to do this whole time. Remember, his whole thing was to get revenge on Rome. Because of what happened in the uh, first Punic Wars and his father that was involved in that. Yep, and and the thing about that is, is it's, it's it's again it's one of those mysteries, just like like the Battle of Kadesh with Ramses the Great and King of the Hittites at the time. We'll definitely get into those in another podcast, but yeah, you know Ramses is he's stuck. Ten thousand Hittites ready to attack. The King of the Hittites doesn't pull the trigger. It's just one of those things. Why don't they do it? What happened? What was the de- what decisions did they make that said, yeah, you know what, we're not going to attack? And the Battle of Zama was the final battle. Right of yep. the Senec- Second Punic Wars. Yep. Obviously, Scipio Africanus did not. Well, back then he wasn't named Africanus yet. Right. Right. Africanus, which a lot of people say it's the African, but no. a lot of people like, uh, but it's really meant African king. Right? right. I believe he actually he might have. I believe he might have got that name after the Third Punic War. Oh, after the third, period. maybe I, I I'm not entirely sure on that, okay. but he might have even got it after Hannibal too. I'm not I'm not completely sure about that, but later on after he beats Hannibal at, at Zama. You go into Hannibal's later years. Hannibal now is, he's not, he's not in North Africa anymore. And that time called Bithynia, it's northern Turkey. What happens is he's still waging war against the Romans. There's a battle, they say, where he, you know, he fights on the water. Not him himself, but he, he's in charge of the armies at that time, the eastern armies at that time. And he, I guess he puts a bunch of snakes, released a bunch of snakes into the Roman fleets in one of their battles. And that ends up helping gain victory against yeah. the Romans in that specific battle. And so the Romans basically said, you know what? As long as this guy's alive, we have to kill him. He's a threat to Rome as long as he lives. And oh, and the, uh, before any of this, uh, he became a magistrate, right? He, uh, yes, he became like essentially almost like a, a politician or a governor, right? And uh, the military career was seemingly over for Hannibal, right? Yeah, but not everybody thought so. Right, that's why he was backstabbed by yep. even the the Carthaginians, right? Yep, yep. And a lot of them feared that he would bring up another army to go after Rome, and they didn't want this to happen. Eventually, he did get surrounded by um, the Roman soldiers. Yep, and uh, he didn't let them take his own life. And, and the interesting thing about that is now they say there's many accounts that say he drank, he ingested poison, or he stabbed himself. 
Either way, he took his own life, and just before he took his own life, he said, I'll never die to the hands of a Roman. It was what they say he said, and then mm-hmm. he killed, took his own life. And the interesting thing about Hannibal is, again, you're seeing another Sun Tzu-type strategy here where Sun Tzu says, no nation has ever benefited from prolonged warfare. I mean, he stayed decades in Italy when he was fighting in the Second Punic War. That's a long time. That's strain on that strain on the Carthaginian state. That's strain on the Carthaginian army. It's even strain on Hannibal. It's when you're there for that long, you need money, supplies, resources to maintain an army. And just like Napoleon said, an army marches on its stomach. And if they have to keep marching for almost two decades, eventually they're going to grow hungry. So that's going to wrap up the YouTube section, guys. We're going to continue the conversation into Patreon and get into some other stuff as well. So I'll see you guys there. And thank you for listening. I hope it went pretty well. It's our first episode. So if there were some audio issues here and there, um, we'll have those resolved for the second one for sure. Thank you guys so much. Make sure to give the video a like. Make sure to subscribe. Hit the bell for notifications. And we'll see you guys in Patreon. If not, we'll see you next week. If you're the put like Hannibal... In terms of like military greats or, you know, the highest military minds in the in history, do you think he's like one of the greatest when it comes to this? In my personal opinion, now, in terms of now, when you look at things from a battlefield perspective, not necessarily war, but just battle, Hannibal absolutely is top three, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Alexander, I would put Alexander, Hannibal, and Napoleon. Yeah. That's how I would put it. Not in that specific order exactly. Those are the names you think of. Yeah, and those three, when it just comes specifically to battle, when it comes to just winning battle, those three are on top. Mm -hmm. I don't, hands down, no question about it. Uh, Timberlane, was it a village he wiped out and he stacked the skulls? And in, uh, yes, in Samarkand, his capital, his own men had revolted against him and he, and he was on his way to go fight against the Ottoman Sultan at the time, Sultan Bayezid. The Samarkand, the people in his empire had revolted and he said, we got to go back home. We have issues to handle. They went back home. Everybody was annihilated. Towers and towers. You're talking skulls stacked. In, it's just absolutely inhumane. But that was the way of fear-mongering, though. You, in other words, he was telling all his other neighboring regions, you do this, this is your punishment. And that really set the example for everybody else. Oh, yeah. You, you uh, bet they didn't re- revolt again. Which, like, fear-mongering, when you look out through a history, even modern history, uh, different kinds of fear, fear-mongering is just, it works. It honestly works. Even though it's messed up, and that's what some of the you know some of the leaders throughout history will do in order to get their people in line. Mm-hmm. Ancient history is no different. 